A reading from the book of Luke. Then Jesus looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. The Gospel of our Lord. It's kind of contrary to common thought, isn't it, that we would call blessed people who are hated, who are reviled, who are poor, who are weeping, who are defamed. It goes against our common sense. And yet, those are all aspects of suffering. And in this passage, Jesus is talking a little bit about how it is that we deal with suffering in our lives. And just uh, to help us along, we're going to define suffering in this way with three components. First is, you didn't choose it. You didn't choose to have this suffering. Second of all, your suffering does not help others. Sometimes we can choose to, you know, take off our coat and give it to somebody else. We might suffer a little bit, but they're helped. And that ability to help others changes the attitude towards our suffering. It helps us to find purpose and meaning in our suffering. So in the true suffering that we're talking about, we don't have a choice about it. It doesn't help others. And thirdly, in fact, it is a burden to others. Maybe not directly a burden to them, but at least it's something that they feel pity on you for. These are the situations that none of us want to find ourselves in. When we are dealing with a suffering that we did not choose, does not help anybody else, and, and in fact makes others' lives more difficult makes their lives harder. And in that situation, in that situation, in that time of suffering, uh, we have a wish. And the wish is to get better. Here in this world, here where it makes a difference in our day-to-day -day lives, in the lives of the people around us, we want to get better. Now, so much of what we're talking about today um, talks about how we deal with that wish. There's lots of ways we can deal with it. First of all, we can pretend that it doesn't matter. We can say, oh, I've learned to deal with this suffering. It doesn't really matter if I get better. Another way that we can deal with the wish is by determination or bargaining. Um, this is kind of the mind over matter way of dealing with it, as if I never admit to having doubts about my healing or getting better, if I never admit to being angry with God over my inconvenience of this suffering, if I never admit to anything bad that somehow that means I will get better someday. A way that we deal with the suffering of others is with false platitudes. We tell them, oh, I'm sure that you're going to get better soon. I'm sure that you're going to be feeling better about the loss or you're going to, your depression will leave or I'm 
I'm sure that a cure is just around the corner. Kierkegaard calls that a mediocre consolation. This idea that somehow by dismissing any thought to the contrary, that we can hold on to uh, and create a cure in this temporal world, that that wish we have to get better will, will be something that, um, that comes true. And we deal with our wish by pretending we have control over the results. These are all ways to scab over the wound of suffering. And that true healing happens when we leave that wound open. We have to leave the wound free from that, those ways that we want to have a scab form over it by pretending that we don't care, by uh, becoming so busy that we can't think about it, by pretending we have control over the results by not allowing any kind of negativity to come into our minds. These are all ways of dealing with suffering that give us mediocre consolation. And don't allow for true healing. I just talked a little bit about how suffering and our fear of suffering has a lot to do with how we deal with that wish, the wish to be better. And uh, we don't have a choice about whether or not we will suffer. In this world there is suffering, but we do have a choice about what we do in our suffering. And in our suffering much like in our loneliness, much like in our failures, our job is still to listen, to act for the good. So that wish does not go away. Inside that wish and with that knowledge, we still listen to act for the good. And Kierkegaard talks about this almost be like being, like stepping into another world. So I, I came outside here to give you a visual representation of what it means to step into a different world. Because for the person who, uh, who has the most luck in the world, who is always having success in this temporal order, who, who gets healed if they have a little bit of suffering, who immediately gets better, who, who doesn't ever lose a job, who never has to deal with depression, that person is as far away from the, the eternal order, the order of things that are most important, the order of the good. Kierkegaard talks again about listening to act for the good. And whether we are flat on our back with illness or have had multiple times of having uh, mental health issues stop us from having what we want in life, from, from being successful, from having the respect of others. Wherever we are in our suffering, we still have that ability to act in front of our audience of one for the good, for the best in the world, to act in that other world, in that eternal world, the world of good, the world that we want to step into, to act for the good.
So in a way, dealing with suffering means giving up, letting go of the idea that this world can be a total representation of the goodness of God. We give up on the idea that this world can contain or even be a beautiful, be, be a perfect representation of God's best in the world. I know uh, when I lost my son, I had to give up on the idea that this world would ever be totally fair. And I didn't, I didn't try to cover over the pain of that loss with the idea that I was going to learn something in this process that would make it all worthwhile. It was just pain. It was just loss. And yes, I can learn things that will help others. The pain and the loss aren't gone. But in that place, I can step into another world. where I determine to act for the good on behalf of others. To be part of God's solution for this world and hope for another. This is the way Kierkegaard put it. Cleverness says that we should never give up hope, but the Eternal says that there is a hope that should be put to death that there is a lust and a desire and a longing that should be slain. Earthly hope should be put to death. And again, that doesn't mean that we don't desire to get better, to be done with our suffering. But the hope that our actions or our busyness can somehow turn this world into a place where the good always happens. When we say that earthly hope must be put to death, it's not the desire to do good in this world, it's not the desire to enjoy the beautiful moments that we are given, the sweet moments of love and caring that we are given. It's not the obligation that we have to help others that needs to be put to death. It's the thought that we create meaning by creating a perfect life in this order that is untouched by suffering. So many times the things that bring suffering are the things that bring us new meaning, new hope, and a new grasp on the eternal. The things that are most important in life. What we are freed from, I think of it kind of like those free climbers, which I don't think I would, I would uh, ask anybody to do. I think it's a foolish idea to be climbing on mountains without ropes. Um, but untethered, the idea of being untethered to the need to make meaning out of things that don't have inher inherent, inherent meaning. Out of um, one more promotion or one more acquisition or even having a life free from um, stumbling blocks, free from free from those things, those setbacks. That's not what brings meaning to our life. We're free to step into that other world where meaning is listening to God's voice and acting on behalf of the good in the world. Making the world into God's vision of what can be. Purity of heart is to will one thing, it means that you have a different address. 
both in this world and someday in heaven. We're understanding that that audience of one is what matters. That audience of one is what gives meaning. And that audience of one is what allows us to swing free on the mountains of life. Not concerned that our need to hold on to security or to, to somehow have health are the only things that allow us to make a difference in the world, to have purpose and meaning. Letting go of the su fear of suffering means realizing that you are acting in front of an audience of one for the good your whole life long. 